I love lists. They keep me focused. Important tasks sit at the top with lesser ones below. All the way down to the one day perhaps category, right down there at the bottom. Unfortunately, urgent jobs have a habit of leapfrogging their way upwards, relegating today's tasks to the day after tomorrow. I posted a two-part video of a Model 100 engine build back in May 2020, with a promise to fit it into the rigid framed 1955 Panther soon. Is three years soon enough? No matter. It tops the list today. So let's get busy before something else breaks. And perhaps we can take it for a run. Soon. First for removal are those components with a leg in both camps. Attachments to engine and frame, like the exhausts. Two of these, on a single cylinder motorcycle, must be P&M's greatest extravagance. Fuel lines come off the tank next, and the high tension lead from the spark plug. Two bolts from the carburetor flange and the threaded top ring set the slides free with their Bowden cables. Putting the bits into stacking kitchen spread tubs will make life simpler when the rebuild gets underway. The Lucas M01 Magneto with its piggyback dynamo held with a strap and pinch bolt. Draw them clear of the Oldham coupling and slip the cable nipple free at the handlebar control to give some additional slack. Slide the rubber boot up the cable and unscrew the advance retard housing from the Magneto end plate. Keep an eye out for the return spring hiding inside. It's a more determined escapee than Houdini and better camouflaged than a chameleon once it hides under the bench. The petrol tank is secured by studs, nuts and washers front and rear with rubber spacers against the frame. Lift it off and let the dog see the rabbit. So to the primary drive and its case. A sleeve bolt sets the brake pedal free. A nut and stud secure the footrest. Place a tray underneath to catch oil, remove the cover screws and work the chain case clear. This five-spring Berman clutch benefits from the special tool to unscrew nuts, 
at least until they clear the studs. Take the opportunity to inspect the condition of friction material. The primary chain split link may include a cranked half link depending on sprocket size. Ours has 25 teeth one down on the maximum of 26. Straighten the tab washer which secures the clutch nut, select second gear and refit the foot brake lever to give yourself something to lock the drive. Three hands and a big box spanner are all you need. It's tight to prevent chatter and the worn splines which result. Not everyone approves, but I wear gloves to save knuckles and keep myself within budget for sticking plasters when putting force into a spanner or socket. Pull the clutch centre from its splines and withdraw the push rod. There's a spacer here between clutch and bearing and this one proves tight enough on the shaft to need a puller on the basket to remove it and the outer washer of the bearing. The rollers remove themselves without any great discipline so it's helpful to know that there are 25 assuming we didn't lose any last time we took it apart. There's another little trap for the unwary here. The inner track is a quarter of an inch thick. A standard quarter inch by quarter roller will go in, but leaves no side clearance, which equates to a light interference fit. The clutch basket will be reluctant to turn. When it gets hot, it will seize. Specially ground rollers were hard to come by in the dim and distant past and the trick was to add a shim of about one and a half thou which provided clearance without interfering with function. The POC spares scheme is among several suppliers of the 0.25 or quarter inch by 0.23622 inch or six millimeter wide rollers these days. You 21st century panther owners just don't know how good you have it. We spend a happy hour chasing rollers round the workshop and cleaning off the swarf before we return to the main event. This Model 100 crankshaft sprocket is taper fit. Later ones were parallel fit and keyed. If we'd had the foresight to remove its nut and lock washer before removing the primary chain, there would be no need to secure the drive now. A pneumatic spanner makes use of flywheel inertia to do the job, but you could wrap the sprocket with a length of drive chain attached to a lever, stuff a length of rope down the spark plug hole and bring the piston up to compression, or any one of a number of methods. We'll need that puller again to remove the sprocket because it's very tight on the taper. A glove on the left hand is a wise precaution. Wait for it.
Now we can pull the inner chain case clear. It's a good plan to drain the oil while the engine is in the frame. Leave gravity to do the hard work and remove the through studs which sandwich the crankcase between engine plates. I guess you don't need reminding of P&M's unique and patented method of saving on front down tubes by replacing them with an engine. A pair of hangers, two thimbles and a stud make connection to the headstock. Slip a scissor jack under the crankcase to support it, out with the stud and bop each thimble with a drift from the opposite side. Time to clear accumulated tools, ready for the big heave-ho. Four volts into the head, set free the long and short coat hangers. Things are going pretty smoothly, aren't they? So why, when I slack off the scissor jack, is the engine still levitating? It can't be rusted in with all that oil about. Perhaps we left a stud in place. I say we, because you need to take some responsibility, or you'll never make the grade. Watching the video, I can almost hear my thought processes grinding their gears until the penny drops. Has this engine really been untouched for so many years? When I put it together in the late 1980s, that's last century if you think I'm mistaken the date, its crankcase was cracked below the drive side main bearing not uncommon with these engines. Here is a case picked up with some other spares long ago and so badly damaged by attempted repairs that it is unusable. There are various suggestions as to why these fractures happen from loose engine fixings to the stress of hauling an overloaded sidecar. Whatever the cause Repairs are required and the risk of distortion is considerable. The cases on our engine were mended with the technology available to me at the time, Lumi Weld. It's a low temperature process which, since the parent metal is not heated enough to melt, is not truly a weld but a form of soft soldering. 
Knowing that my repair would not be as strong as the original cases, I came up with a novel way to strengthen the assembly by welding a bracket to the engine plate. This was then sandwiched between the U-bolt saddle and the engine case. The obvious downside is that to remove the engine you must fully remove the U-bolt. With the long nuts off the top I can drive it down, but it's considerably longer than the space between engine and bench. Getting clearance is hazardous because the rear stand is sitting on the removable plate. Hold your breath for me while I clamp the front wheel firmly and reposition the scissor jack under the engine plates to take the weight off. It's a bit wobbly until I set the stand back down. A block of wood into the U and the bolt comes free. And with one stud replaced, lower the jack to let the engine swing forward. Gloves on again, a bit of wangling and it's free. Time for a clean up with solvent, brush and hose pipe. And then remove the worn engine, add it to the bottom of the four rebuild list and roll back the empty frame. I've decided to remove that additional bracket. Will I regret it? Probably not. In the past I've taken out a 120 Outfits engine which has the P&M modified system with bolts coarse threaded into the cases and replaced it with a U-bolt engine. We pulled a loaded sidecar with no problems. So out with the trusty angle grinder and ball keen hammer. While he does that, let's look at a few old pictures. Here I am haggling for the 1955 Panther project in the mid-1980s. And following a basic rebuild, here we are on the Irish Munster Club rallies in 1989 and again in 1990 with Angie on her BSA B31. This is from 1991 on a vintage motorcycle club run in Norfolk and here returning from the 1993 Panther National Rally with me on the Vintage 500. The Panther went briefly to stay with our son in South Wales, returning little changed a few years later for local Panther meetings in 2016 and 2017. Yes, it is due for a fresh engine. With a clean up and a lick of paint, we're back to standard form with the engine plates. There's just the little matter of a new decompressor cable, the old one well past its sell-by date. For that we need a length of cable 
an adjuster, nipples, ferrules and the tools of the trade. A former for the cable ends, monster soldering iron, steel wool, baker's fluid flux and plumber's full strength leaded solder. Cut the outer cable to a length which will give nice easy bends from handlebars to rocker box. Create a mop top head on one end of an over length inner using the former clamp and a hollow punch. Slip the first nipple on from the plain end and with everything spotlessly clean pull the formed end of wire into its recess. Dip it in baker's fluid, get it all hot with the iron and flow in solder. A flame can be used with care but taking the steel wire to red heat will soften and reduce its life where it is most stressed next to the nipple. Keep the joint still until it is completely set. Assembling as I go helps avoid back tracks because the sweet spot between an inner too short and too long is surprisingly tight. With the operating lever assembled Set the adjuster about halfway and slip the outer cable over. Check against the handlebar control lever, making sure you have full movement. Cut slightly over length to allow for forming the cable end. Slip the nipple on, clean up, create another mop top, dip in flux and apply solder. And finally, run a file over to remove any excess for a snug fit in the lever without binding. Fitting the rebuilt engine will be covered in part two which I see is right at the top of the list.